Namutasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Hello and the video should be live. So we're here back at the Buddha Center and we're going to continue the reading of the Sakapanna, a talk given by the Venerable Monk Mahasi Sayadaw. Um, we're going to continue the study. And last time, we just left off um, with this... Um, let's just see if I can't look it up here. There was this woman who was laughing uh, kind of in a sensual way, and then this elder the venerable elder, all he noticed was like uh, the shape of a skeleton um, when he saw this woman and so uh, that was Mahatisa Tera and so since it's been a while since we uh, left off. I think we're just going to read um, from where we left off the story of Mahatisatera and then continue with the story of the Chittakuttatera and then we're going to continue on. But first let me just get into the position we placed ourselves in here. And so today, we're sitting here at the Bodhi tree. And so we're going to be reading the Dhamma to the Bodhi tree here in Second Life. I thought that would be a nice thing to do. So let's just see. I think it would be nice if we could get the whole tree in picture. Oops. Maybe like so. Okay, not to spend too much time on it. But we're here at the Bodhi tree. Oops, that's not on purpose. So I'm going to look at the text here and gonna get reading and make sure that you have the text in front of you. I'm gonna be putting the link below to the talk and the stream seems all right. Continuing now with the story again of Mahatisatera. While going to Anaruda city to collect food, Mahatisatera met a woman on the way. The woman had quarreled with her husband and set out for her parents' home. She was well dressed and at the sight of the Tera she laughed seductively. Formerly, the Tera had often reflected on the impurity of the human body and on so looking at the woman, he had the vision of a loathsome skeleton. Thereupon he attained the first jhana, and through vipassana meditation he became an arahat. The husband, who had followed the woman, met the terror and asked him whether he had seen, the wo seen a woman. The terror said that he had only seen a skeleton that had gone along the road. The Tera might have practiced contemplation on the impurity of the human body for a long time. 
His experience is a lesson for the yogis who need not to be disheartened for a lack of progress. For they will attain insight in due course if they keep on trying. The Story of Chittagutta Terra Just gonna move this to the center here. The control of the senses as practiced by another Terra is cited in the Visuddhimagga. Terra Chittagutta dwelt in a cave in Sri Lanka high up on the walls of the cave. There were frescoes of the Buddha's birth stories, the Jatakas. Being always on his guard in regard to the, the senses, the Terra never looked up and so he remained wholly ignorant of the pictures. Then one day some monks came to see the cave. They were fascinated by the pictures and they told the Terra about their beauty. The Terra said that he never noticed the pictures although he had lived in the cave for, for over 60 years. So he had been living in the cave for 60 years and he was so mindful that he didn't ever even look up at the pictures. So he didn't see the pictures. His reply was an indirect rebuke to the visitors for their lack of mindfulness in respect to their eyes. There was a Gangao tree near the entrance of the cave. The, ter the, the Terra never looked up and so he knew that uh, the flowers were in bloom only when he saw the pollens on the ground. Hearing the news about the Terra's holiness, the king invited him to the palace. In spite of the repeat, repeated invitations, the Terra refused to see the king. Then the king forbade the suckling of infants by the mothers in the village where the Terra went about to collect food in the morning. So out of compassion for the children, the Terra went to the palace. The king and the queen paid respects to the Terra, and the Terra blessed them one after another, saying, May your majesty be happy. Then the young monks asked uh, the Terra why he had addressed both the king and the queen as your majesty. The Terra replied that he had made no distinction between the king and queen. This is a lesson for those who practice the restraint of the senses. Funnily enough, this, this doesn't uh, read out from the text, but the venerable Chittagutta Terra, he, the reason he said, may your majesty be happy, was because he could only see their feet. And so he didn't know which who, who was the king and who was the queen. And so he just said to both of them, may your majesty be happy. At least that's how I remember it from from my time um, studying the Dhamma. And so continuing on. The most important thing is to avoid sights that give rise to defilements. And if these sights are unavoidable, to contemplate their impurities or to make a note of seeing, here we should bear in mind the Buddha's reply to Ananda on the eve of his Parinibbana, when the latter asked him how a bhikkhu should behave vis-à-vis -vis women. The Buddha said that a bhikkhu should avoid seeing women. If he cannot avoid seeing them, he should not speak to them. If he, can, if he cannot avoid speaking to them, he should be mindful and regard a woman as his mother or sister or daughter according to her age. This is the first practice as suggested in the Bara Parata Vacha Sutta of the Samyutta Nikaya for the conquest of sensual desire. The second practice mentioned in the same Sutta 
is reflection on the impurities of the human body. The third practice is the restraint of the senses. The Buddha, the Buddha's teachings. Oh, I'm sorry. The Buddha's teaching applies to other sense objects as well. We should av we should avoid listening to sounds such as songs, etc., that lead to defilements. If we cannot avoid them, we must make a note of hearing. The need for such mindfulness is obvious in the case of monks and yogis, but the Buddha's teachings was addressed to Sakka and other Devas. The Devas are usually minded in sensual pleasure and so it is necessary for them to restrain the senses as far as possible. The same may be said of the lay disciples when they observe sapat or practice meditation. Scent, uh, oh, scents of flowers perfumes, etc., that cause defilements are to be treated in the same way. So, uh, so is it, so is the Okay, so is the food which the yogi should eat only after due reflection, that he eats not for pleasure but for, but to preserve his health. Sensations of taste and touch that lead to uh, defilements are also to be avoided if unavoidable. They should be dealt with in the same way. Making a note of walking, sitting, etc constitutes mindfulness of sensation of touch. According to the commentary, the practice of Nisatya Dutanka is the pursuit of wholesome sensation of touch. Nisatya Dutanga is the ascetic practice of some yogis who never lie down but remain in sitting posture even when asleep. Sariputta, Mahakasapa, and other prominent disciples of the Buddha practiced it for long periods ranging from 12 years in the case of Rahula to 120 years in the case of Mahakatsapa since they are arahats the objects were not to acquire merit but to serve as examples for posterity the yogis should patiently make a note of wholesome sensations of touch and practice vipassana, keeping himself mindful of unwholesome sense objects. When he has unpleasant sensations in the body, he should not fidget, but exercise patience as far as possible and keep on contemplating them in accordance with the teaching of the Sakapanha Sutta. Moreover, the yogi should not think of anything that can give rise to craving or ill will, and he must obtain, abstain, he must abstain from doing so, not only in respect of the mind objects or thoughts that occur to him at present, but also in regards to those in the past and the future as well. They should be noted and rejected. And that was the story of Chitta Gutta Terra. Continuing on with the next chapter, the self-restraint of the three Terras. The commentary mentions the story of the three Terras whom we should emulate in our effort to remove unwholesome thoughts and practice mindfulness. On the first day of their, of their rain retreat, they admonished one another and pledged to have no sensual or aggressive thoughts during the three months. months. On the Pawarana day that marked the end of the Lent, 
The eldest Terra asked the youngest Terra how he controlled his mind during the Lent. Pa Pawarana day is the day on which a bhikkhu invites another to point out his faults or breaches of Vinaya rules that he had unconsciously committed during the retreat. The young monk said that he did not allow his mind to leave the monastery, but it kept but kept it confined within the building. He meant, of course, that if his mind went astray during his meditation, he restricted it to the monastery, that he never thought of anything in his neighborhood. His accomplishment was indeed laudable in view of the fact that by and large yogis do not have a firm hold over their mind before they develop concentration so that they cannot so that they cannot prevent their minds from wandering when they practice mindfulness when the terra asked the second young monk the same questions the latter said that he did not allow his mind even to leave his room so his power of concentration was more developed and superior to that of the younger monk. Then the two young monks asked the elder Terra how much control he had over his mind. The Terra said that he did not allow his mind to leave his five internal khandhas. This shows that he confined his attention to the psychophysical phenomena that arise at the six senses at every moment of seeing, hearing, etc. The Terran's ability to concentrate is almost wonderful and perhaps he was an Arahant. The three Terran's attainment in mind control is indeed an inspiring, oh I'm sorry, is indeed an inspiration for the yogis who practice mindfulness. The commentary commenced the contemplation of mind objects together with metta, etc. So we should cultivate metta, loving kindness, etc., saying, may all beings be free from danger, and so forth. That is karuna. So wishing for the non-harm of beings is karuna or compassion. And Mitta is wishing for the happiness of beings. So in saying, may all beings be free from danger. Mm, that could be Mitta, knowing that being free from danger is the highest happiness. And what is meant by danger on the voyage? And so I think with this explanation, it could be Mitta. Anyways, moreover, since the commentary says metta etc it is to be assumed that all mind objects should be commendable for inside knowledge vipassana in short vipassana contemplation of any kind is commendable because it means the accumulation of wholesome karma so i was i or i mean you know <laughs> Vipassana meditation is like the highest moral conduct because it cuts off anything else. So there's not really m anything else to do or more to do or anything to add. Vipassana is much more for the purpose of cutting off the defilements, etc. And so, rites and rituals and bowing down to the Buddha None of these come even close or can compare to the practice of vipassana. Um, in a, as far as uh, morality goes, that is the highest training. Continuing on now with the next uh, chapter or what is this? That, that's kind of a paragraph or something. Anyway, Satipatthana, a big heap of good karma. Of the many kinds of contemplation, 
The Buddha describes the four Satipatthana as the sum total of all wholesome dhammas or kammas. Giving a lot of alms or leading a very good moral life may mean a big accumulation of wholesome kammas, but the donor or a morally good man may be occasionally harassed by irrelevant thoughts and of course it is impossible to perform dana or practice strict morality all day and night. So it is not true if you call dana or sila a big heap of wholesome dhammas. On the other hand, so dana and sila, that is uh, generosity and morality. And so you cannot just practice generosity and morality such as um, worldly morality. So, uh, I mean, going beyond the world, that is like becoming a meditator or a yogi, as they use in this text. So, again, even dana and sila, good things, does not compare to that of the practice of vipassana. In regards to accumulating goodness, and keeping high moral standards. Okay. On the other hand, the practice of Satipatthana Vipassana <laughs> I was told this doesn't actually exist. So sat Vipassana is insights into the Satipatthanas and the Satipatthanas mean the four foundations of mindfulness which are as the Buddha taught body, kaya, feelings, vedana, and thoughts, citta, and the truths of, or the dhammas, um, the truth of the arising phenomena. It's a little bit uh, hard to explain what are the dhammas, so I'm not going to go into that right now. But yeah, seeing clearly the four foundations of mindfulness, body, feelings, thoughts, and mind, or dhammas, mind objects. That is Satipatthana Vipassana. Okay, continuing on, starting over. On the other hand, the practice of Satipatthana Vipassana requires constant mindfulness of all bodily behavior, feelings, thoughts, acts, of seeing, hearing, etc., barring sleeping, barring sleeping hours at night, the yogi has to be mindful at every moment. He makes a note of his feeling, etc., at least once in a second, and this means he acquires one wholesome dhamma in that period of time. He has 3,600 wholesome dhammas in an hour or if we if we exclude four sleeping hours he gains merit to the tune of 720000 wholesome dhammas in a day merits accu uh, accrues i don't know what accrues means maybe it's a typo merit occurs okay so maybe yeah merit occurs to him at every moment of sitting. So again, you, this is what I was talking about. You can sit down and attain a whole heap of goodness. Okay, here we go. Merit occurs to him at every moment of sitting, or standing, or lying down even, uh, practicing, or walking. He acquires it even while he is urinating mindful. So, Satipatthana is no doubt a big heap of wholesome dhammas that should be cultivated. Sadhu, sadhu. Very good. And I think we can get another one here. How long? Oh, we've only been going along for 25 minutes. That's awesome. And so, now we continue into talk on the diversity of views. The Buddhist discourse was much gratifying to Sakka. 
before he came to see the Buddha, he had met with silt-styled sages and made inquiries about their teachings. He then found that they held different views. Now that he had attained the first stage on the holy path, after hearing the words of the Buddha, he knew the true Dhamma, the Saddhamma. And hence he knew also the true Buddha and the true Sangha. He was now free from all doubts. He did not tell the Buddha about it explicitly, but it was implied in his question to the Lord Buddha. Lord, to all those who call themselves Sammana Brahmanas hold the same views? Do they all lead the same moral life? Do they have the same desire or do they have the same goal? Of course, Sakya knew the answers to these questions. He asked them only as a prelude to the question about their differences. The Buddha answered his, question, his second question as follows. O Sakka, in this world people do not have the same kind of temperament. Their temperaments are different. They reflect wrongly and they firmly and obsessively cling to the views that suit their temperaments. They insist that only their views are right and that all other views are wrong. Because of their bigotry, all the self-styled sages and holy men hold different views. They are committed to different systems of moral values. They have different desires and different, uh, and different goals in life. Owing to the different temperaments, people differ from one another in their inclinations and preferences in regard to color, sounds, clothes, and so forth. Likewise, they talk about the beliefs which they have accepted on the basis of their attachments and speculations. Some cherish the belief in the immorality. Oh, I'm sorry. Some cherish the belief in the immortality of the soul. They say that the soul, Atta, exists forever. That it is not subject to destruction like the gross physical body. This is the eternity, Sasatta, belief. It has, or view of self. Is also known as view of self, lasting and satisfying self, Atta. It has mass appeal and it does not differ basically from the religions which teach that man is created by God, that after death those whom he likes achieve salvation in heaven, while those whom he dislikes are condemned to eternal hell. Then there is the annihilation, Ucheda, uh, belief, which denies the future life and insists on the complete extinction of the individual after death. These are the doctrines of religious. These are the doctrines of religions which claim the monopoly of the tr of truth and reject all other teachings as false. Such bigotry is the cause of differences in belief, moral life, aspirations and goals in life. Oops. Okay. So let's change the camera up for a little bit.
okay so this looks fine we're now sitting under the Bodhi tree so I just accidentally changed the the thing okay so back to the text here Yeah, and we just ended off with Saka asking the Buddha on the diversity of views. And the Buddha asked, answered that these kinds of bigotry cause differences in belief, moral life, aspirations, and goals of life. Scrolling down and continuing on with the next title here. Eternal Sasata. Eternal Belief and Buddhism. According to Buddhism, a man who dies is reborn, the new existence being conditioned by his karma. This raises, que this raises the question of whether the Buddhist theory of rebirth smacks of the eternity belief. But the Buddhist teaching is a far cry from the idea of a permanent ego. For Buddhism denies the ego entity and recognizes only the process that involves the ceaseless arising and passing away of all psychophysical psycho phenomena. When the rebirth consciousness ceases, there arises Bhavanga Chitta subconsciousness, which also passes away one after another, with the Bhavanga Chitta always in this state of flux there arises the consciousness that reflects on the visual form sounds uh, sights well they, that's uh, the visual forms etc this reflection consciousness is followed by eye consciousness ear consciousness and so forth the, when this consciousness ceases bawanga chitta takes place. In this way, the two streams of Bhavanga Chitta and ordinary consciousness flow ultimately. And, and at the moment of death, the Chitti Chitta, the last unit of subconsciousness, passes away. The extinction of Chitti Chitta, Chitti Chitta is termed death, which therefore means the cessation of Nama Rupa process without the arising, arising of new consciousness. So the Nama Rupa processes ceases, the body mind phenomena. Immediately after the cessation of Chutti Chitta, there arises the rebirth consciousness and conditioned by one's karma, this, this rebirth consciousness marks the beginning of a new existence. So rebirth has nothing to do with ego entity or the transfer of Nama Rupa from the previous life. With the cessation of this view consciousness, there arises the continuous flow of Bawanga, etc. in the past existence. The person representing the Nama Rupa does not embody any Atta or ego entity. This fact can be realized by those who practice Vipassana meditation. Buddhism is not sasatawara since it teaches that craving leads to rebirth when the yogi attains arahatship he is wholly free from craving and other defilements the arahat is not attached to any sense objects on his, on his deathbed and this rules out the arising of new nama rupa but it does not allow but it does not follow 
that Buddhism teaches annihilation or uchitavada. For the annihilation view presupposes the ego in the living being, the ego which is subject of experiences, good or bad. Buddhism rejects the ego and recognizes only the stream or process, that of Nama Rupa. On the death of the Arahant, it is not the ego but the Nama Rupa processes. Process becomes extinct. This extinction is brought about through the practice of vipassana that ensures the end of the craving for a life. Continuing on here, Mahayana and Theravada. There are now four great religions of mankind. Their differences are due to different temperaments of their followers, and so is it, and so is the diversity of views among followers of the same religion. There are two schools of Buddhism. Wees. Theravada and Mahayana and they, ha and they have held different views for over 2,000 years. This is due to the difference in the inclinations of the adherents of each school. The basic teachings of Mahayana Buddhism is that all living beings achieve complete freedom from samsaric suffering only after attaining Buddhahood. Being an Arahant or Apachika Buddha does not mean full liberation. After becoming a Buddha, the Mahayanists do not enter the Nibbanic state alone. He enjoys the peace of Nibbana only with other beings, that is, only after all other beings have become Buddhas. This is an indirect repudiation of egoism, but the view is quite untenable. For if the, Buddha, if the Buddhas are to defer their parinibbana, their own enlightenment, and wait till the attainment of Buddhahood by all other uh, living beings, where and how are they to live for where and how are they to live for such a long time insects and other forms of lower life are innumerable and are and so are buddha and so are the buddha to wait and suffer old age sickness and death till the liberation of the lowest living being this mahayana view makes little sense and yet is acceptable to some people because it suits their temperaments. That's strange. So it's like the Buddha shouldn't have become the Buddha because we are not Buddhas. <laughs> but that's our problem, right? That's stupid. It's ridiculous. It's insanity. Okay. It differs from the doctrine of Theravada, which is the true Dhamma, based on the Buddhist teaching in Pali Pitaka. So yeah, we don't actually speak Sanskrit. Those are for the Vedas, as far as I know. I mean, yeah, I don't know anything about those guys. We speak Pali, the language of the Buddha, even though it is a dead language. It's kind of alive on these, in this corner of the universe. And this, and it, in this way, it is called the sasana. The sasana is alive. The Buddha sasana. The very, 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 very rare thing in the universe, in any universe. I mean, even in the universal cycle. 
and in this cycle we have had four Buddhas that's insane that's a lot of Buddhas over like uh, trillions of years I guess anyway Okay, so I'm going to read this uh, line here again. It differs from the doctrine of Theravada, which is the true Dhamma, the Satama, based on the Buddhist teachings in Pali Pitaka. According to the Theravada, among the yogis who reached the last stage on the holy path, there are those who aspire to be the close disciples, Sawaka, of the Buddha, after the Parinibbana, these Arahats cease to have Nama Rupa for rebirth, and so there is an end to their samsaric suffering. They have ended suffering as in accordance with the Dhamma laid out by the Blessed One. They, n they need not await for anybody, nor is it possible for them to do so. This is the density oh I'm sorry this is the destiny too of Pacheka Buddhas, private Buddhas and Sammasam Buddhas, fully enlightened Buddhas like the Buddha Gotama as a Sammasam Buddha or present Buddha of which we still have the Dhamma even though it might be in decline uh, or other uh, fake teachings are taking the forefront which is unimaginable ho unwholesome karma anyway that's really scary this Theravada view is quite reasonable Mahayana Buddhists identify their Nibbana with Sukhavati abode. They describe it as a paradise and say that as Buddha as Buddhas all living beings live there happily forever being free from old age sickness and death. Sukhavati does not differ essentially from heaven that is glorified by those who believe in immortality. The belief is probably based on the writings of those who sought to spread the Sasata eternity view among Buddhists. Later on there arose many Mahayana sects and this was also due to different temperaments of their followers. So even in the Mahayana there are sects divided within it. Mm, another thing we know of the Theravada is it's a teaching by open hand. So there's nothing hidden but I mean for someone who has a simile who is just learning to drive a car you I mean you know you don't uh, put them in uh, like a like an airplane or you know like a jet fighter when they're trying to learn to how to drive a car and so you have to acquire or attain to some uh, basic skills <laughs> in you know pretty much anything you wish to undertake or study and practice to fu to fulfillment and completion and so this is more of uh, the logic of um, the teacher you know seeing the state of the pupil so to say continuing on in the text the commentaries tell us how Theravada split into 18 sects and Myanmar today there are differences of opinion regarding the Buddha's teachings 
No doubt the Buddha emphasized the threefold way, sila, samadhi, and panya, morality, concentration, and wisdom. Compromising the Eightfold Noble Path and the Four Noble Truths. But some say that it is not necessary to practice vipassana, that they can follow their easy way to salvation. Some dismiss sila as irrelevant to the goal of Buddhism, a view that is shared by those who do not care for morality. They talk of such views because they do not accept the teaching in the Sakapanha and other suttas. So they're going to be eaten by the turtles. If you know the simile of the lotuses, the four kinds of lotuses, the four kinds of beings or humans. And this also, go, I mean, tells the story of how it is our accumulation of karma that decides our future rebirth. As either of these four types of persons, as the book I pointed out with the Lotus simile, not the Lotus Sutta, which is insane, a Mahayana teaching, but a Lotus simile. And yeah, we're not going to have that one right now. Basically just saying that there are some lotuses that never grow above the water, and so they become food for the turtles. And so there are three other kinds with training and uh, practice. They can attain to full liberation, Nibbana. Okay, continuing in the text. The Buddha's teaching to the wandering ascetic, Subhata, provides a criterion for deciding whether a certain doctrine is the true Dhamma for the conquest of the defilements. The gist of the teachings uh, is, which is to be found in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta is that no doctrine that is devoid of the Eightfold uh, Path can lead to Suttapana and other stages on the Holy Path. The Eightfold Path is found only in the Buddha Dhamma, and so it is only this Dhamma that will make a man a Suttapana, or a woman. A woman could also become a Suttapana as well as a man. No, no distinguishing between the genders here in uh, relation to attainment of the Suttapana stage. Anyway. Uh, we can judge a doctrine by this criterion and see whether it accords with the Buddha's teaching. But the fact is that most people accept those teachings that accord with their inclinations. Some Buddhists believe that theirs is Aryan morality if they regard oops such annoying um some Buddhists believe that theirs is Aryan morality if they regard what they practice an Arya Sila. Some people want to enjoy life only as human beings, Dewas, etc. They do not relish they do not relish the prospect of the cessation of Nama Rupa process and suffering. Some do not wish to be reborn in the Brahma worlds that are devoid of sensual pleasure. They prefer rebirth in the sensual world. Some crave for the renewal of both Nama and Rupa. But some want only one of but some want only one of them to be renewed. On the other hand, the wise men who realize the evils of samsara the endless life cycle. Seek the extinction of both Nama and Rupa. Some believe in eternal happiness in heaven or annihilation after death as their destiny. 
for some the, the supreme goal is the perception uh, the perception is oh I'm sorry for some the supreme goal is the perceptionless asanya world which they believe is free from all suffering again some regard the formless arupa world as their ultimate objective while some say that their goal is to make a clear distinction between atta and mind-body complex these various goals depend on the different temperaments of the people who pursue them in reality the highest goal of life is the nibbana of the arahant which means the complete cessation of nama rupa continuum of the parinibbana due to the total extinction of all defilements and with that i think we're going to end this episode because we're going to have to um, have something to contemplate and ponder before going into the next episode and so this is to the study that we're going to do today and next time we're going to be continuing on with the next chapter which is very leading from where we are now it's called the ultimate goal and so we can look forward to getting to study and make known and make vivid and make clear the ultimate goal of the Buddhist practice and so this was the fifth episode of the study of the Sakapanha Sutta or more uh, precisely the talk given by the Venerable Mahasi Sayadaw on the Sakapanha Sutta and so thank you so much for joining me today and I hope for my wish is that you may uh, find true peace, happiness and uh, freedom from suffering and that is uh, lasting happiness true peace and freedom from suffering thank you and let's just end this episode by paying homage to the Bodhi tree Sadhu and for the second time Sadhu and for the third time Sadhu And let's not forget the outro. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Swakato bhagavata dhammo sanditiko akaligo ehi pasiko om